Hello, I am Lindsay Rustad, a research ecologist with the USDA Forest Service, and I have been studying climate change and its press impacts on forests since the early 1990s, and ice storms and their pulse impacts on forests for over a decade. My goals today are threefold. Uh, one, to tell you about ice storms and why they appear in our list of press events. Two, tell you about research we've already done on ice storms, including results from observations and experiments. And three, share some of my initial pre-workshop thoughts on lessons learned and next steps. So ice storms, not sure if any of you have been in a major ice storm, but they are simultaneously one of the most beautiful natural events, as well as one of the most terrifying. Ice storms occur in northern forests around the world. Here you can see images of ice storms in the US, China, and Eastern Europe. They cause a tremendous amount of damage. Here in the US, they account for roughly 60% of winter storm losses. They've caused more than 16 billion in insured property losses between 1949 and 2000 alone. They result in major infrastructure disruption. Roads, schools, businesses, they all have to close during major ice storms. And unfortunately, they do result in injury and loss of life. We do know some things about ice storms. For example, we know that ice storms have generally occurred along an ice storm belt stretching from East Texas to New England, as well as parts of the upper Midwest and the Pacific Northwest. And we know that at least here in the Northeast, return intervals for ice storms are on the order of 35, uh, for extreme ice storms are on the order of 35 to 85 years. For moderate ice storms are in the order of five to 10 years. And we are seeing light icing uh, just about every year. Looking forward, we don't have a crystal ball, but we do have models, and there are two groups that have modeled the future occurrence of ice storms. The first is Cheng and colleagues back in 2010. They used statistical downscaling tools and projected a 40 to 85 percent increase in freezing rain events by the 2050s in south central Canada. The second team is Heho and Swathimi, part of our team. They used advanced machine learning algorithms and they projected an increase in the intensity of ice storms in coming years here in the Northeast. Shifting gears to impacts, we know something about the impacts of ice storms and forests from observational studies. There are two storms that were widely studied in the US, the 1998 ice storm in the Northeast and the 2014 ice storm in the Southeast. They were both large storms affecting millions of acres of forest and caused billions of dollars of damage to forests and infrastructure. Based on these observational studies, we've begun to understand what makes some tree species more susceptible to ice damage than others and what other factors exacerbate the effect. So for example, some tree characteristics are important and these include mechanical properties or the tensile strength of wood, canopy architecture, including the surface area of branches and twigs, whether a tree is a hardwood or a softwood, its rooting depth, whether it's shallow rooted or deep rooted and its regeneration pattern. We also know that weather variables like wind speed, temperature, precipitation and soil water can all exacerbate the effects of icing. So without going into greater detail, we certainly learned a lot about ice storm impacts and forests from these post facto or after the fact observational studies. However, there are problems with these studies. These include one, there are only a few of them, two, they lack true controls, and three, we don't have data on the actual amount of ice that occurred in the stands during the storms. So overall, a rigorous determination of cause and effect was problematic. So to address this, we turned to the scientific method and we conducted the first ever ice storm experiment at the Hubbard Brook Experimental Forest in New Hampshire. As an overview, we adopted an integrated approach, which is what I advocated in my 2008 paper, and it included theoretical, long-term monitoring, modeling, and experimental components. Due to time constraints, constraints, I'm only going to talk about the experiment today. The experiment was conducted at the Hubbard Brook Experimental Forest. Hubbard Brook is a 3,200 hectare outdoor laboratory in the beautiful White Mountains of New Hampshire. It was established in 1955 by the USDA Forest Service 
and it is now one of the longest continuously running, most comprehensive ecosystem studies in the world because of its infrastructure, its long-term forest protection, and its location in the ice storm belt that I talked about before is an ideal place to conduct a large-scale forest ice storm experiment. For our approach in 2015, we set up 10 20 by 30 meter plots in the Hubbard Brook Valley. Treatments included replicated reference plots, quarter inch ice in one event in one year, half inch ice in one event in one year, three quarters inch ice in one event in one year, and half inch ice in one event in two consecutive years. And the purpose of this was to look at the impact, what happens if ice occurs in two consecutive years. A note that the half inch ice in one year was approximately equal to the 1998 ice storm. The plots were located in the middle of the Hubbard Brook Valley, about three miles up the road from headquarters. They were wedged between uh, the road uh, on one side for ease of access and the stream on the other as a water source. We then spent uh, most of 2015 uh, measuring everything from the top of the forest canopy to the bottom of the rooting zone. This included measurements on the physical environment, vegetation, microbial dynamics, nutrients, and wildlife. I'll provide results for uh, just a few of these ones highlighted in yellow uh, today, but just know that there were a lot of things that were also uh, evaluated. In 2015, we also conducted pre-treatment trials of our icing technique to be sure that everyone was trained under the best of conditions so they could work well under the worst of conditions. In pulse experiments, you may just get one shot at applying the experimental treatment, so you'd better get it right the first time. We then conducted the icing of eight plots in the winter of 2016 and the two mid times two plots in the winter of 2017. And here is a clip of what it takes to do in a winter ice storm experiment. Torch, if you could bring it down the stream, that'd be great. If we have anybody with eyes on gasoline, we'll be wow. We're at the bottom of the plot. We also have to remember to record the time when we start the train. Twenty-five is the time we started. Is there anyone near the trailer who can bring a pole saw from up there down to the Kubota? Sure, let me just find one. I'll bring it down. And here are just a few pics from the aftermath of the simulated ice storm. So this is what it looked like in the middle of the night during one of the icing treatments, including some down woody debris here. Here's what it looked like when we finished our work at sunrise. Another look at some of the tops of the trees snapped off. A closer look at where a branch ripped off, leaving a large wound. Here's a conifer that weathered the storm pretty well because they close up like an umbrella and then they open up when the ice melts off. Here's a look at some of the understory in that signature bent over pattern that is iconic of iced forests. And here's a downed understory tree that had crashed to the ground. And finally, here's me feeling pretty punchy after a couple of all-nighters, but also happy that we pulled it off and no one had gotten hurt. Few key results. First, of course, was ice. We measured ice and wooden ornaments suspended in the trees. In this graph, the dark maroon bar on the left is a target ice, and the two bars to the right are the measured ice with two different methods. Overall, we were able to create a suite of low, medium, and high ice treatments. We evaluated canopy openness with hemispheric photos during leaf on and leaf off periods. I think you can see the increase in canopy openness in both of the two seasons. Um, here is a graph of gap light index. And again, I think you can see that increase um, in light in the gaps, um, particularly in the mid, the mid times two and the high treatments. We used terrestrial LIDAR to measure canopy structure. Results showed that icing changed the vertical distribution of the leaves. In general, with increased icing, there was a loss in the upper canopy and an increase in the lower canopy. 
Results also showed an increase in canopy rugosity, which is a measure of the roughness of the canopy. Um, here again, you can see that increase. This is, I should have said this before, 2016 and 2017. So this is 2015 is a black bar, the control year, and 2016 and 2017 are two treatment years. So you can see that increase in canopy rugosity um, for all of those treatments. For fine woody debris, we collected all woody material less than one inch in diameter in a highly sophisticated litter basket shown in the photo on the left. And you can see the first year increase in fine woody debris with increase in treatment on the left. And then the second year a pulse of fine woody debris with that mid times two treatment on the right. For coarse woody debris, we collected all wood greater than one inch in two by two meter subplots in July and November following the treatments. In this upper left hand graph, you can see the first year July increase in coarse woody debris uh, with treatment with a big pulse in the high ice treatments. In this lower left, you can see the added input of coarse woody debris following the second year mid times two treatment. On, on the right, the graphs just show that most of the wood came down immediately after the treatments with really no significant increase in inputs later in the year. For basal area increment, we analyzed tree cores. Results showed a significant decline in basal area increment in the high ice treatment shown here in dark orange, particularly compared to the low ice treatment shown here in gray. It was also notable that there was a significant decline in basal area increment in this high ice treatment uh, over time. And the final result I want to point out is soil solution nitrate. Remember, um, this, this was, um, I didn't show it, but this was one of the big signals from the 1998 ice storm. Here we report absolutely no change in any metric of microbial nitrogen cycling or soil solution nitrate. This just shows uh, the soil solution nitrate over time for the different treatments. You see seasonal trends, but there's no significant difference between the treatments. This and some other data from Hubbard Brook has led us to develop a theory of nitrogen oligotrophication in the Northeast, uh, but that's uh, for another presentation. So here's a summary of our major findings, uh, which you can find there in our online research brief. Um, in brief, um, as we applied a suite of low, medium, and high pulsed ice storms, we documented a gradient of branch breaking with increasing ice increased canopy openness, especially in the high ice treatment, change in canopy structure with loss of branches from overstory trees and bending of saplings and understory trees, especially in the high ice treatment, increased inputs of fine and coarse woody debris to the soil, roughly commensurate with treatments, no change in microbial nitrogen dynamics or soil nitrogen loss, and evolution of tree decline and loss of basal area increment over time, especially for that high ice treatment, and really a tipping point in the response between 0.5 and 0.5. 75 inches of ice. We had some surprises, uh, only minor changes in soil temperature and soil moisture. We think this is due to shading from nearby forests and the size of the plots. No change in soil biological cycling of carbon and nitrogen, perhaps due to that minimal change in soil temperature and moisture. No change in soil solution nitrogen export, likely due to the minimal change in soil biological cycling of nitrogen. And overall, everywhere we looked, biogeochemical changes uh, were relatively small. So here are some of the lessons learned from our experiment. Uh, the first was that multiple treatment levels are super important to evaluate tipping points and to gain a perspective on what to expect across a gradient of natural icing events. Two, underlining templates of climate, pollution, land use matter. We suspect that our lack of a nitrogen response was due to the overall lower nitrogen status of the site and the tighter cycling of this nutrient now compared to 1998. Three, species and canopy position matter. Pick your sites carefully. Here we saw very different responses between the overstory maples and the understory beach. Four, think big. We thought our 20 by 30 meter plots were big, but they still weren't big enough. We had shading from nearby intact canopy and clearly had roots infiltrating the site from trees outside the plots. Five, think long term. Uh, tree response evolved over, to, evolved over time. 
and six, be safe. We put safety first, but we still had some near misses. For the next gen uh, experiments, I have five suggestions. Uh, the first is we need more pulse experiments. We need more pulse types, think hurricanes, tornadoes, floods. We need more replicate experiments. We need more experiments across gradients. We more, need more experiments across biomes, particularly socio-ecologically, -ecolo economically important or underrepresented biomes. Two, uh, we need to combine pulse experiments with rapid assessment of naturally occurring pulse events. This is combining experiments with observations. Three, we need new compound pulse experiments. Think hurricane fire or tornado flood. These combinations were unthinkable or laughable a couple of years ago, but they are a reality now. Four, we also need new compound press and pulse experiments. Think elevated CO2 leading to tissue nutrient imbalances, followed by, we'll say, an ice, ice storm. Five, please design long-term experiments um, so that we can understand the long-term evolution of a response to or recovery from pulse events. It's likely that pulse events can lead to ecological tipping points leading to a reorganization of communities. This will not happen overnight. It is important to follow the main effects and then the cascade of secondary effects that will happen uh, over time. So lots more to talk about, and I look forward to our conversations this afternoon. Uh, thank you for your attention uh, this morning.